Of course, this one I'm going to do my presentation on, Saiga Antelope, or Saiga tatarica, there's a picture of it there. So a general background on this mammal, it's a critically endangered antelope, it has been since 2002, when it was labelled as such by IUCN. Um, it's a nomadic herding species, so basically it likes to be in groups of about 30 to 40, but when it migrates, which is every year, it can be in groups of thousands, or even sort of tens of thousands, it can migrate thousands of plants every year. So it inhabits these open, dry, step grass, grasslands, sorry. It actually used to be everywhere between the UK and Alaska, but that was sort of back in the Pleistocene, which for anyone who doesn't know is sort of the last ice age and before that. So it used to, um, the land that connected with Russia and Alaska is no longer there, the Bering Land Sea Bridge. <coughs> so it's obviously, uh, due to climate change, it has, it has withdrawn sort of the area in which it can inhabit, but not, not to this extent. This is, been a, there's been a big decline recently. So it's just three areas in Kazakhstan, it migrates into Uzbekistan throughout the year. There is one separate area in Mongolia, but that's a slightly separate subspecies, so I'm going to go into that one today. So the morphology bit is really interesting. Um, it kind of looks like something out of the ice age that hasn't quite developed, it's missed a sort of evolutionary step. It's got this massive nasal cover thing. Um, but although it looks a bit funny, it's really a piece of kit because um, it's really flexible. And it's essentially, it, it, let's say it migrates in these huge hordes across the desert making tens of thousands of kicking up dust, and basically this can filter out all the particles in the air before it takes it down into the lungs. So that's one thing, and obviously in the winter, um, it actually can inflate and it can warm the air before taking it down into the lungs, so it doesn't get any frostbite from that, luckily. And obviously it's got this um, sort of, I don't know, caramel coloured coat in the, in the summer, it sheds all its fur, and then it can build up over the course of the year, this massive woolly coat for the winter. Um, it, it's thought that this sort of evolutionary sort of step might be because of a bottleneck about 10 to 15,000 years ago where they're not sure why, but there was just a big loss in genetic variability, which is why they all still look the same as they did. But no one's 100% sure. So there were around 1.25 million uh, in the countries I mentioned before in the 90s, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the sort of legislation protecting it went out the window, 95%, uh, more than 95% of it was lost in under a decade which is unparalleled loss, really, it's crazy. Um, so there was no legislation regarding poaching in trade. Uh, the meat and the horns, especially in the males, were going to China to be used for medicinal purposes. Um, and this is now outlawed, thankfully, but there was a huge decline. Um, this still happens in poor rural areas just because they haven't got them, they still still poach in sort of regards to the legislation. Um, and it went from being just sort of actually vulnerable in the 90s to five years later being critically endangered, it went straight past being endangered. Um, and it's severely skewed sex ratio because of the horns, which are only on the males, going to China for, this, for the medicinal purposes. Sometimes the skew is as bad as one to a hundred. Although it's, um, a male can be, with, has been known to be with up to 40 females at any one time, so it's not, it's not that bad, but it is very, very drastic skew. Um, but there is a lot of conservation in place, and Sightings, which I know a few people have mentioned, that's, that's completely out of the, um, the trade of anything to do with the animal. Um, so these four countries where it's primarily found, where it's actually where it's only found, uh, they sort of came together, they made a treaty sort of regarding the conservation of it, so they're all working in tandem together. Has started to reduce the impact of roads and infrastructure, that's due to the migration of it, so they didn't want anything to be in the way, because it can move a thousand kilometres north and south every year, they didn't want anything sort of interrupting that. So they're sort of going down every avenue trying to make sure that it's going to be all right. And there's a hunting band for the next, well, when they put it in, it was a decade, hopefully less than that. And it actually worked brilliantly. Um, so in 2013, it had more than doubled after its massive crash in the 90s. It doubled back to a quarter of a million. Um, and that was that, really. It's, if I was doing this presentation sort of two or three years ago, it would be a happy ending. But unfortunately, these aren't the only things that are affecting it, uh, which we saw last year. So this is May 2015. These are just a couple of sort of articles that came out. And there was a huge, huge mass mortality in the space of a fortnight, which is unheard of. So this was from a <coughs> scientist when I did this, I've worked in veterinary disease for my whole career, and I've never seen 100% mortality. And this is related to one of the groups that was found, which is actually a herd of about 60,000, and every single one of them is dead. Every single one of them. Um, which is again unheard of. And there was another subpopulation about 300 kilometers away, separated globally, they couldn't have been together at any point, but that was, they also suffered 100% mortality. Um, and no one's quite sure why. There's um, a theory that it might be to do with 
uh, carving, I think, not carving. I think when, when they, they, they gather in large groups, when they're giving, when they're giving birth to young, and some and that makes them a little bit more vulnerable within a large group. But that's not likely to go up 100% of any sort of group. Um, Polyarcrobal disease is the best guess, basically. It's pathogens in the body already, like pastoral and clostridia, that sort of might be enhanced by environmental factors, potentially. Um, but even then, to wipe out as many as it did is, is unheard of. Um, so that's another threat on top of sort of other natural human threats. So in conclusion, um, hopefully the good work will continue, as obviously apart from mass mortality, aside from mass mortalities, which seems to be sort of, it's happened before, it seems to be part of their DNA. But um, the good work needs to continue, hopefully everything, all the cooperation, all the restrictions, all the trade bans, that will stay in place. Hopefully we can just try and make them more resilient to these mass mortalities once we find out what's really causing it. Um, so yeah, it's not a sort of black and white case, it's, it's a very complicated one. Nearly a success story, but not quite, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.